Kondreta's monetary wave. This is probably something that I find very fascinating and interesting because it helps explain the social cycle over a long period of time, right? And this, this was the epiphany for me when I read, and, and, and that work, by the way, I want to give the tip of the hat to Michael Alexander's book, The Kondratev Cycle. He wrote ooh, over 20 years ago, and he was also a fellow long waiver, as we call it, a great contributor. And it's a great book. It's a very technical book, but I'm referencing that book quite a bit. Uh, what my job is uh, and what I'm realizing is to simplify the long wave. And again, we want to talk about this long wave and this long wave that really started since the Industrial Revolution. And we have these cycles of inflation, then deflation at the bottom, and then a ba an upturn, right? And that I sh I'm going to label this in the future, but that K4 peak was in the 70s. And this cycle should be bottoming in the 2030s, right? So in simplicity, the long wave is driven by new technologies that create productivity, real wealth. In that wealth, the standard of living in the individual rises. Uh, governments, through taxation, take some of that wealth and redistribute in terms of the social programs. That was the latest uh, long wave where government, right, centralization grew. And the down wave, we have a slowing of the economy. The financialization takes over. And the reason is simple. I'm going to use this product. The, the reason why everybody has one of these, and I remember purchasing one back in the early 90s. I think it was one of the first to have a car phone. I'll show how old I am. And nobody had to force this on society, right? It became better and cheaper and expensive. So pretty much everyone in the world has access to it. And this is technological revolution. This is part of this fourth wave. So think of the banking sector during these monetary waves. So what is the banks? What is their business? Credit. Okay. Now, during the up wave, 1946, if we actually look at the data, that was the beginning of the up wave. And pretty much Canadians and Americans and Europeans were devastated after World War II and their credit was restructured, deleveraged, bankrupted, defaulted on, and then started a new leveraging cycle. And, and that leveraging cycle included real estate, which was new, and credit cards. I think they weren't even invented till the early 1950s. So that's, that's what's different about this cycle, right? The, the, the credit card and the long-term uh, amortization and um, uh, mortgages. Now, here's an historical data and turning points. And again, I want to uh, you know, give a tip of hat to Michael Alexander. Um, I'm using reference from his book, The Contrative Cycle. And if I agreed with it, I've just adjusted some of the dates. The most important thing I want you to take a look at is the monetary ways. And if you notice during fall in cycle one, the monetary bull market, as we call it, what followed was uh, economic depressions. Because again, the business of, of banks is to uh, issue credit. They create most of the credit in the econ global economy today. And if their product, which is credit, becomes cheaper, people look at their cash flow. They don't look at necessarily the amount of credit they're taking. So this monetary bull market becomes a falsation of, of reality. It, as the BIS said recently, it overtakes the real economy, and then we have economic winter to deleverage all that, and the cycle turns up as Ray Dalio has alluded to, right? So look again, the monetary wave, the, the, the second one, and we had the monetary bull market, and then we had the long, they called it back then the long depression. It was deflationary during the late 1800s. Cycle three, most important, look at the dates again. The monetary bull really uh, started in about 1920 and it continued 
up until 1929, and we know the economic depression that came after uh, we had a false spring and more winter until 49. I, I kind of dispute that. You know, my, my models uh, suggest 46 was the bottom. Here's the current cycle, cycle four at the bottom, the up wave 49 to this is the up wave when interest rates peak. Spring occurred between 1946. We had summer, which was actually during the 70s. Where the economy was overheating, the monetary bear, where the stock markets went sideways. And here we have the longest monetary bull market in history, 40 years. And the reason why it lasted so long, obviously, is the involvement of the central banks and a fiat monetary system. Um, has it worked out for society? Obviously, no. That's, I mean, the data shows we have the greatest credit bubbles in history especially in Canada. We surpassed <coughs> the credit uh, bubble uh, ja that Japan had in 1989. <clears throat> so you can see here the monetary bull is over. Uh, does winter start this year or next year? That's what we're taking a look at, right? So the most important part is to understand is the monetary wave, part of Kondratov's down wave, refers to a time when credit costs decrease, leading to an artificial increase in wealth that is not based on actual investments and their returns. This phenomenon occurs due to inflation and credit, but eventually it's a debt deflation where the inflationary cycle gives way to a deflationary one. Ultimately, the unsustainable, unproductive debt collapses, resulting in the banking crisis. And, and that's where we're headed, right? That's where we're headed next year. Banking crisis are, are part of the, the long wave. It, it ends. Uh, because an important point here, and the BIS alluded to this in 2015, is that the economy has become financialized. Well, we've just ex uh, just extended that in 2020, 21. It was basically free money. We were just giving away money. Now, an ignorant consumer, and I'm very careful of the word. I'm not saying stupid. That's a, that implies something like ignorant, unaware, right? I was ignorant when I purchased a home in 89 that I was uh, buying into a bubble. And I paid the consequences for that ignorance. I'm not ignorant anymore, obviously. And I learned a lot because of that. So when I say ignorance is that I'm not blaming Canadians, Americans, Europeans, or the, uh, New Zealanders or Australians for you know, moving into leverage because they looked at the cash flow and how much debt they carried. So that's an important point. But we need to be cognizant of what's coming. Like that, that's, the, that's the key takeaway about the monetary wave. Now, if we look at real estate prices, right? we can see when Ponzi Finance started, this is in Canada, of course. And if we compare, we draw some trend lines here. When you look at real estate prices, historically, and I learned this from uh, John Templeton, is that long-term prices fluctuate in and around inflation and real incomes. And even if you throw in population growth, there is no reason that house prices should be expensive. So we don't have the pop, we didn't have the population growth. Uh, we didn't have inflation. Uh, we didn't have incomes rising. Real incomes have been stagnant in Canada since the early 80s. So what caused it? Falling price of credit. And now that bottom, right? It was a 5,000 year low in interest rates. Society's leveraged. Now interest rates are in a secular rise and all that artificial phantom wealth collapses. Now people want to believe that it's this time is different. They can stop it. They can prevent it. They can do this. They Look, Japan tried everything and they had a surplus and a high savings rate and a global economy that was deleveraging and their economy still collapsed uh, real estate prices collapsed um even stock prices and they still haven't recovered from the high in 1989 even real estate prices now I'll hear you up there immigration immigration <laughs> i mean seriously if they can't afford to buy a home, it won't support asset prices. And I've disputed that thesis on one of my Twitter posts, and I will post that on my uh, on a YouTube video in the future. Okay, so you can see that this is uh, reversing. Now, if we look at 
the latest numbers, and as I said before, this is uh, Canada ho uh, home prices, and this is during the monetary wave, right? So again, we can see in the early 80s, prices went sideways. Then we had that first bubble where prices quickly tripled, and that was simply because interest rates fell. Then it went sideways for a decade. Again, why? And then you see the, the rise in fel uh, phantom wealth. And I said before, and this is an important point, what drove Ponzi finance, unsustainable asset inflation through credit inf uh, inflation. That is it. There is no other reason. All the other theories just fall by the wayside when you uh, uh, look at it and really understand that. Okay. Now, um, my website has been updated and uh, the information is there and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But the book that I re refer, if you're uh, interested in the long wave, obviously you want to read Kondratiev's, uh, Kondratiev's first book and then Business Cycles, which lays out the thesis of the long wave and uh, Michael Alexander's The Kondratiev Cycle. It's, I, I will warn you, it's technically heavy. It's not a simple one. I, that's what I've realized, right? There's the long wave nerd, nerds will probably read it. Very few people will read this book, but it's an excellent book. I have a digital version in my hard copy or soft copy. It's just falling apart because I've referenced because it's so good, right? Michael did a great job of putting that together, right? So you can go to the economic long wave and I'm building up a list of books that you can read. This is for people who are interested in learning more. Okay, so questions. Again, I am purposely trying to red pill you slowly, inform you, educate you to understand this great of great social cycle that I discovered. And I became fascinated after my experience uh, with re the real estate bubble and in the same year started the investment business and I didn't know what to recommend and the internet revolution was starting and I, I, I just find it fascinating, right? And I still do uh, because it explains, right? There's, it puts order in all this chaos. It explains you. This is a, a social cycle that's reflective of humanity. That is you. It's not some wet dream through Klaus Schwab that wants to control your life. I mean, seriously, you, I mean, look, I get people think that it's going to work. It's going to collapse. It, it will fail. Society will never accept enslavement, but there's going to be a lot of economic damage and we need to be cognizant of the stupidity and the ignorance of politicians and those who subscribe to more centralization because the long wave is going this way now, right? It's decentralizing. That's that's the, another key takeaway. It's not going in the direction more power to the elite. If anything, the elite are taxed to death and uh, people will be very upset as the middle class collapses from this phantom wealth. And by the way, this phantom wealth is not only Canada, but in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. They reinflated their bubble and it's overvalued by 50%. But I, I do like uh, your input and questions. I've learned so much. Great questions. And don't think, by the way, your questions are stupid or ignorant. Because a lot of people are thinking the same thing. So if you have a question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer it. And, and you make me think. Because I'm always questioned, right? That's science. That's real. That's real theory. You need to question whether your thesis is wrong. That's how science is done. And all I know is since I discover the long wave in the mid to late 90s, I'm more convinced. I don't even believe it's a thesis anymore. I'm so convinced of its accuracy. But we've built on Kondratov, right? And Sean Peter added to it. And there's a lot of great names behind me who have built my own knowledge, right? What, all I've done is there's so many books as I've consolidated that and some focus on technology, some on the political cycle, some on the social cycle, and some actually have a model. And I said, wow, I could build a Canadian model, which I've done. Because after my experience, and people know the story in 2008, uh, where I was right about the uh, economy imploding, uh, where I allocated the money, uh, I'm not going to name names, certain firms didn't do their job, and I was furious. I was furious. 
And so I said, that's it. I'm going to create the best, well, that's the goal, one of the best forecasting models in the world. And history will be a judge of that in the future. That, that, that's it, right? It's, but I've designed this for myself, right? I'm a baby boomer and realized that uh, this cycle has come to an end and it will devastate our generation. Uh, but who wants to lose 50% of their capital anyways? I don't understand this buy and hold. You can put 90% in stocks when you're 20 and you should only put 10 when you're 90. If the market is cheap, very cheap, who wouldn't allocate more uh, toward equities? Because ultimately, you just don't want to overpay for assets. If a company's making money and uh, you're at the bottom of the business cycle and the company is cheap, why wouldn't you allocate more than 10, 20, 30, 50 percent? It makes absolutely no sense. There's these theories about buy and hold. They just don't make sense to me. So anyways, um, one last plug, of course, is the updated uh, website. And thanks for the input. This has come from um, you, uh, the audience, and all those subscribers. And every single day, more people are joining. And I appreciate that. Uh, I still have the decoding, the long wave, all the services I pr provide. Now a blog, which is now live. If you want to know about me and, or contact me, it's there. And the resources, uh, that are books, right? These are books that I reference, use, give a tip of the hat to, and so forth, right? So, and so, uh, subscribe to my Substack account uh, there. If you like what I have to say, you have access to the model. And the model is a tactical asset allocation model. It basically is a interpretation of Martin Pring's book, right? And I didn't realize when I uh, learned technical analysis back in 2000 that there was a long wave model. I said, I love this because it takes the business cycle into account, takes valuations into account because we just don't want to overpay for an asset. And those who subscribe know we have a heavily cash position. Now, obviously, the only thing I will divulge, obviously, I'm extremely bearish, extremely bearish on real estate. It, there, there is no fundamental reasons for the ridiculous prices in anywhere in the world. So that I will divulge. Uh, what you do, I've always said, you should work with a financial advisor planner. That's what I did for 23 years. Uh, but uh, yeah, if he only, so there's, you're not, there's not a bias and uh, have access to the model. And the model gives you an insight of where to allocate based on history. And the history goes beyond 1980. It goes beyond uh, 1930. It, it, it looks at all of history because we have 100 plus years of history, uh, especially the long wave. I'm using 500 years of data uh, because ever since the advent of the printing press, that caused the explosion in the information revolution and other revolutions, the Italian Renaissance. Now with the internet, this revolution just accelerated and we're doubling information about every six months. Yes, I understand a lot of it, it's noise and so forth, but that's not the point. One to 5% of that is informative to those who are producing, creating wealth, innovation, and errors. Where there's corruption, that's going to collapse, and that's another video. So the most important thing is this information revolution. And let me leave you with something that's I find amazing. To this day, one million people are joining this information revolution. Can you imagine them joining, or you join today, and you have access to all this information globally? access to how to fix your computer, your car, uh, modified by the best people in the world. I mean, this is why mainstream media is collapsing. They're not servicing the public what they want or need. The, the internet is doing this. Anyways, uh, I hope this was informative. You know, please, uh, your comments and information, anything you want to ask, don't be embarrassed about it. Let me know. Subscribe uh, to uh, this YouTube. Pass it on to those people because I will educate them, but I won't get into particulars, right? I can't. So you can't ask me particulars. I've got this much and how much. I can't do that. I The, the model is sy systemically similar to every person, whether you have 50,000, 5,000, or a billion dollars. It's It has to be the same. And it's really takes so in, into account valuations and where we are in the business cycle and never overpaying for assets. You probably understand why, because I was devastated and wiped out. Don't want any part of that.
Anyways, hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for listening and we will talk soon.